Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you, and it's good to be with you, and to have this, this privilege, this opportunity to, uh, to bring forth the Word of God, and I hope that when you leave here today, when I leave here today, that, uh, or when you turn off your laptop or TV, for those who are tuning in online, that you will be encouraged, that you'll be strengthened, and that you'll be challenged to draw closer to Christ and fulfill His will in and through your life. I don't always give my message a specific title. A lot of times when I preach, I'm in series with the team, and it could be such and such part two, part three, part four. So a lot of times I'll just put that there in my text. But this morning, I want this message to echo in your spirit as it's been echoing in mine. Uh, so that, like I said in my prayer, that it would be like a seed that falls on good ground and take root in, in each one of our hearts and lives. And so I'm speaking on the subject today, God started it and God will finish it. God started it and God will finish it. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Amen. God started it and God will finish it. Is there anyone in the house or watching online today that knows that God will finish what he has started? Amen. 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 Someone's agreeing already. There we go. Coming into agreement. Well, for over 40 years, my dad was a very skilled mechanic. Uh, he was a heavy-duty mechanic by trade, and uh, he could fix just about anything. Uh, in fact, I've never seen him come across, and I'm sure there is, but I've never seen him come across anything he couldn't fix. And I, I know when I was a boy, I'd bring him toys, and I'd bring him things to him, and, and uh, I've never walked away without it being repaired. And uh, no matter how... Uh, challenging the issue, no matter how hard it would be to repair, he would find a way to make it work. And there were times when, uh, when he would fabricate, and make up his own parts. And, you know, that old school type of mechanic can weld, can do anything. And, and uh, as a boy, I would spend time out in our garage with him. And he had a pit, a uh, place where cars could come in and park, and he'd go underneath them. He didn't have a lift like you have today, but he had a little pit there, and, and he would be out there and saying, can you hand me a, a, a ratchet? Can you hand me this? And I'd have to, I didn't have Google, so I struggled out in that garage trying to hand him tools that I had no idea what he was talking about. But anyways, uh, you know, a lot of times I hold the light <laughs> for him while he did his thing. And, and you would think that after spending hours and hours as a boy um, in the presence of my dad, my father, after watching and repair cars and trucks and all sorts of, of various kinds of vehicles, you would think that the mechanical giftings uh, and insights would transfer from him to me. But you know what? That is not the case. I think it skips generations. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at it. You can ask my wife. You get a chance. You can ask her. I am getting better at it. I, I, you know, it's taken a while. Uh, I'm not as bad at fixing things as I used to be. Uh, and my kids bring me things. I'm able to actually bring them uh, repaired back to them. Uh, and, uh, but I don't even, I'm not even close to what my dad has in regards to mechanical abilities. Not even close. The closest I had to it was back in high school, uh, a buddy of mine and me created super duper uh, wipers. They were heated wiper blades uh, for a science fair project. And that's what we called it, super duper defrost wipers, back in 1997. And uh, they actually worked. I should have patented it. And uh, anyways, that's beside the point. But in general, I do not have the same kind of talent when it comes to fixing things. And, I, and, and you know, as I think back to my childhood and teenage years, I started out doing several different types of projects from time to time. Uh, start to have confidence that, you know, I think I can do this. And uh, I remember trying to build a birdhouse. And, uh, uh, but after I put it together and I put it out and put all kinds of seeds, the birds went on strike. They were out there with little picket signs. And they said, no, I, I, they were frightened to death to come near it. They don't care how much food is there. And eventually became firewood, it became kindling. And on, on another occasion, I remember taking several bikes. And, you know, I'm, I'm the youngest of five. And uh, I had two older brothers and two older sisters, and, and a few bikes would be out around, you know, and, and some would not work for different reasons. Well, I decided I was going to take all the different bikes and parts. I'm going to make one super bike, one good bike that I can use. And uh, it ended up at the local dump, <laughs> all the parts and the bikes, and I just got frustrated with it, couldn't do it. And uh, there were many other projects that I started but was unable to properly finish, and they were abandoned. 
And like I said, my father was not like that. When he started something, he finished it. He didn't give up on it so easily. He didn't throw in the towel. He didn't get frustrated and abandon what he had in mind. And some things may have been a work in progress, but he always finished what he started. He always completed what he set out in mind to create. And this morning, that truth that I witness in my earthly father, I see as well in my heavenly father. You see, what God starts, God finishes. And what he plans to come to pass, he brings to fulfillment and fruition. And church, he will not abandon what he has started in you and in me, uh, but he will see it brought to completion for the fulfillment of his divine plan, his divine purpose, and his divine will. Is there anybody that can say amen to that this morning? And today we're going to be taking a closer look at Paul's letter to the church of Philippi, and, and we're going to learn the biblical truth that what God started, he's going to finish. Looking at uh, Philippians chapter 1, <clears throat> should be on the screen. You can also follow along in the words if you have it on your iPhone, whatever, whatever device you're following on. Philippians chapter 1 verse 3 says, I thank my God. In all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy. In my every prayer for you all, in in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident, and this is where I want to focus this morning. I am confident of this very thing. That he who began a good work among you, or some texts say in you, will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Now, now this letter written by uh, uh, Paul the Apostle was not just like any old letter. It, It was not meant to be passed around and circulated like other letters that he had written, like the letter to the Ephesians, for example. But the the letter that Paul wrote was a very personal letter uh, that was meant to be received by them alone. Scholars tell us that uh, he, uh, Paul, was in a Roman prison cell some uh, 1,280 kilometers away from these Philippian believers when he wrote the letter, who were very near and dear to his heart. You see, about 10 years prior, Paul visited Philippi during his second missionary journey, and on that missionary journey, he had led people to the Lord, such as the uh, Philippian, uh, Philippian jailer or, or prison guard and his family, and also Lydia, the seller of purple fabric, and her family, as we can see in Acts 16. And after some time ministering in that city, Paul established a local church there. And those who came to know the Lord became, like I said, very near and dear to his heart. And Paul's purpose in writing them was to thank them for their kindness and for their generosity towards him. And to remind them about the joy that comes from being in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And in his desire to encourage them, he tells them that God, the one who began a good work in them, would ensure it would be completed. It would come to fruition. It would come to fulfillment. It would be fulfilled. And that is what I want to focus on today, church. That For as just as Paul desired to encourage those believers in that church, I desire that you would be encouraged by the infallible word of God today. Now, when, when Paul stated that, you know, because sometimes we read scriptures and read them over and we move on. But when Paul uh, uh, was talking about that God would finish this good work that he had started, what was he referring to specifically? Well, in the text and in studying the text, we see that the good work that Paul was referring to, first of all, was salvation, was salvation. Salvation is the good work that God does for us, the good work that God does for us. Uh, uh, This good work is God's work. It's a sovereign work. Salvation from sin is not something that we can earn. Uh, Salvation is not something that we can manufacture and produce by our own means or merits. No, it is solely and entirely a work of our Heavenly Father. It is a gift uh, given by God to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And Paul in his letter to Titus touched on this truth when he said in Titus 3, 5 to 7, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which, which we did in righteousness, but accordance with His mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, 
so that having been justified by his grace, we will be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And when Adam and Eve disobeyed God way back in Genesis, the result for the very first time was for the, the very first time sin entered the picture. And if you're not familiar with this word, allow me to define it for you. St. Augustine defines sin as this, a word, deed, or desire in opposition to the eternal law of God. A word, deed, or desire in opposition to the eternal law of God. Of God, And there's not one of us who is sinless. Some of us may think we're perfect. Some of us may think that, you know, we don't do no wrong. But we have all broken God's moral law. No matter how good we are, no matter all the good things that we have done, the existence of goodness in our lives does not negate the reality of the existence of sin in our lives and the need of God's grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. In fact, Paul, in writing to another church at Rome, said in Romans 3, 23, for all sin... And fall short of the glory of God. Only Jesus was sinless. And the rest of us, as David put it in Psalm 51, were born in sin and in need of a Savior. And that is what the gospel is all about. It's all about the good work that God has done for us. Through sending Jesus to pay uh, the price for all of humanity's sin. That was the promise of God in response to Adam's disobedience. That there was coming a second Adam who would bring redemption and restore what was broken by sin. And so from Adam to Jesus, God was doing a, a good work to fulfill his promise of salvation to us. It was something that God did for us. Paul, in yet another letter, this time to the church at Ephesus, said in Ephesians 4, or 2, 4 to 8, but God being rich in mercy, aren't you thankful he's rich in mercy? Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the boundless riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And verse 8 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the what? The gift of God. And the truth is this morning that without God in the picture and without God fulfilling his uh, 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 promises and without God bringing this plan about, salvation would be not an option to us today. Amen. Salvation is the good work that God does for us. God sent his son, John three sixteen. God sent his son into the world to bring about salvation. It was his plan it was his plan of salvation, his plan of redemption, and it was accomplished by his means. And in our text, we see that God is the one who called these believers unto himself through the ministry of Paul. Paul come and preached the message of salvation to them, and after hearing the message of the gospel, they humbly received it. But the fact remains that the good work was the work of none other than Almighty God. Jack Muller in commenting on the text says, He who began a good work among them at Philippi was not Paul, not even the Philippians themselves by their conversion, but God. It is a work of grace that is meant here and which, we can only, which can only be the fruit of divine action. And Paul reminded the Philippians that God who saved them from their sins and brought them into a relationship with Jesus uh, would see that uh, they would remain connected to him until the day that Christ returned for his church. The good work that God began in them would be brought to completion through the return of Jesus Christ and eternal life would be theirs forever and ever. And the same truth applies to us today. That if we follow Jesus and if we believe in him, the good work of salvation that God has done for us through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, his only begotten son, will be carried into completion. God started it, and amen, God will finish it. Secondly, in studying the text, we see that the good work that Paul was referring to was sanctification. First salvation, next sanctification. And sanctification is the good work that God does in us. He does a work for us through salvation, but sanctification is the good work that God does within us. The word sanctify means to set apart for sacred use or to make holy. 
And so when we receive salvation, we become saved, uh, we, and when we believe in Christ and we follow him, the Holy Spirit, now this is, is so amazing, the Holy Spirit indwells our lives, and we're set apart for God's purpose and instantly made holy in the sight of God. Notice it didn't say that we are perfect from now on. No, there are times and moments when we'll fall short of God's standard for holiness in our words, in our thoughts, in our deeds, in our actions, because you know what? We're human, and we have not arrived at the place where sin will no longer be uh, uh, in the picture. You see, the process of becoming like Jesus, and that's the goal, to become like Christ, is an ongoing experience. It's something that's continually, day after day, taking place. It's a day-by-day process whereby we're spiritually growing in the holiness and righteousness of God. And you see, even though we're sanctified and spiritually purified instantly upon salvation, and even though the Holy Spirit enters our lives, we still have the capacity to sin and do what's wrong. If you want an example, just look at our kids. (laughs) And my wife would say, you want an example? Look at your husband. <laughs> In Galatians 5, 16 to 17, Paul spoke about this battle that we have as Christians as we try to walk by the Spirit and we try to follow after God, yet, you know, uh, we, make, we make mistakes and we don't, we, we, we don't do what he wants us to do, and we just live holy before him. Uh, the, the text is, but I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not carry the desire of the flesh, for the desire of the flesh is against the spirit. There's a battle there. And the spirit fights against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. And even though we have a, a, a daily fight against the flesh, even though we have a battle to fight against our, our what's called the sin nature, the fact of the matter is we're not left to fight it on our own, to fight it in our own strength in our own ability. But when we come to faith in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells us and day by day, by day by day, he strengthens us and leads us in the things of God and into the holiness of God and in obedience to his word. Paul speaking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. Some of you uh, certainly can quote this verse. Some of you know it. Some of you, first time you're hearing it, 1 Corinthians 3.16 says this. Do you not know that you are a temple of God or a sanctuary of God, as some texts say, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? How would that change our our mindset, our day-to-day living If we kept that before us, when we're driving, we have that in on our horn, on our on our steering wheel. Sorry, on our steering wheel. That you know, when drivers cut you off, you do you not know that you are God's temple. You know, you won't get upset. We might fall short of the glory of God from time to time, but you know what happens? God picks us up and He dusts us off. And through the power of the Spirit dwelling in us, he helps us to walk in the ways of God and the will of God and in line with his word. You see, as Peter noted in 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16, God calls us and commands us to live holy lives. It's a a tall task, but through the the power of the Spirit, it's, it's possible. But it says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And in the latter part of our text, Paul attempted to remind them and encourage them to walk in holiness and righteousness and be sanctified and set apart for God's glory. Verse 9 and 11 says this, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you'll keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. Verse 10 says, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you, you may live pure and blameless lives. I'll just say this, when when we named our son Noah, we put a scripture upon his wall. It says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God, and I want that over his life. And that's what God wants for us, that we may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return, 
He says, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. We have not arrived yet, church. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We say things we shouldn't say and have to ask for forgiveness. We do things we shouldn't do. But following Jesus, you see, is a journey filled with ups and downs. But we're not alone on this journey. We have the Holy Spirit of God within us, helping us, strengthening us, leading us, directing us, encouraging us to keep moving forward, to not give up, to keep moving forward in God, keep moving towards God, to keep moving with God, and to keep moving for God and his glory. Amen. God started it. God started the good work, and God's going to finish it. And thirdly and finally, in studying the text, we see that the good work that he was referring to was service, which is the good work that God does through us. As mentioned previously, the church at Philippi was very near and dear to Paul's heart. He loved them and they loved him. Paul had established the church there and they had been a great blessing to Paul during his ministry. We see that in verse 3 to 5. He says, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, offering prayer uh, with joy in every prayer for all of you. And this is why. In view of your participation of the gospel from the first day until now. You see, the Philippian believers were partners with Paul. They had given to him during a time of need and continually partner with him through various means to see the work of God come to pass. Now, it's important to know that Paul addressed this letter not just to one type of people. You see, in that church were saints, overseers, deacons, and, and the letter was addressed to them all. The saints were the lay people, and they were the one who were led by the Lord under the ministry of Paul, uh, directly, either directly or those, uh, or those connected to the church. And the word in the Greek that Paul used for them is hagai, uh, which literally means those set apart. But Paul also addressed the letter to the overseers and deacons as well. As one scholar says, the overseers or bishops were responsible, <clears throat> excuse me, for shepherding or pastoring the flock. The deacons were those uh, church leaders who had special service responsibilities in the assembly. And Paul thanked them all for their partnership in the gospel. You see, it didn't matter what role they had. They, they were able to be used of God, each one of them, and serve in his kingdom and make a difference. It's like I said to our First Impressions team, you, uh, this morning, we do our huddle at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning before anyone comes. We meet and, and we go over a bunch of things. And I say, you know what? Uh, you know, the welcome, the worship, and the word, three key areas. I constantly put it out there. And I said, you know what? Any lives are changed today, you've got a part in it. Thank you for serving. We have a partnership. We partner. And I, I remind our teams all the time, we are partners with the Holy Spirit to see lives change. If someone gives their life to Jesus, you have a part in it. If someone uh, gets healed, you have a part. If someone takes the next step, you have a key role in part, in part in that. They understood that they were all servants of God. They knew they all had a part to play. They realized that God and the good work that God worked uh, through them would continue until God called them home, either through his return or uh, th through, through the grave. And church this morning, God has called us all to be his servants. Whether you are young or old, whether you're educated, uneducated, God has called you to serve him by serving others. Peter speaks of this kind of service in 1 Peter 4, 10 to 11. It says, as each one has received a special gift. Do you know that you got a special gift? Each one has received a special gift employed in serving one another as good stewards of the multifaceted grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do uh, so as one speaking the actual words of God. Whoever serves is to do uh, as, as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What gift has God given you? What gift has God given you? What special gift that he's, has he put and deposited in your life? Are you using it for his glory? Are you doing what you can to advance the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. Here at Bethesda, we believe that every person has a gift, has an ability, has a role to play, serving the Lord faithfully, which is a key part of becoming a disciple of Christ. I created a discipleship, uh, discipleship path a few years ago, uh, shortly after I come here, and we say, you want to become a disciple, become a regular attender, you know, grow uh, as in small groups, start serving, start giving, and that's how you fill out the mission of God, and that's sort of an overview. But as all those things together, I'm thankful that you're here this morning, but, you know, if you're just attending, there's something, you need to take a next step. Because you have a gift that God wants you to use in this place, in our community. If you have been serving, I want to say God bless you. You know what? I always say Bethesda is the best volunteers on the planet. I want to thank you, and especially over the past couple of years. I know ministries, certain ministries shut down, but certain ministries were launched. And it's been a challenging couple of years, and I believe we're on the other side of it. But if you have served through that, God bless you. Maybe you've served in the past. And, you know, you're not currently, I want to thank you for your past faithfulness, but God still has a work for you to do. And if you're not serving today for whatever reason, we invite you to take that next step. Visit Bethesda.ca slash serve. I oversee our, our volunteers. If you take a next step, you'll get a, you'll fo- I'll follow up with you. See what areas there are to serve. And like I said, we'll follow up with you. We believe that God has given each one of you a special gift, and we want you to discover that gift. We want to nurture that gift. We want you to use that gift for the glory of God. You know, the God has has set you and I apart to serve him and become partakers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God has a good work that he wants to see brought to fruition through us. Whether that's kids ministry, first impressions team, our media team, or some other area. Serving is how we partner with him to see his will come to pass, to see lives changed by the power of God in our church, in our community, and beyond. Inviting the worship team to return as I bring this message to a close. And not only serving, which is giving of ourselves, but being generous, giving of our finances, as the Philippians were in this text with Paul, Giving is a key way to be used of God and to partner with him through the local church to spread the good news that there's a God who cares, a God who has a plan and purpose for their lives so we can spread the good news of the gospel. And if if you have been faithful in giving and supporting the good work that God does through our church, God bless you. Appreciate your faithfulness. But if you have not had the opportunity to participate in this uh, way yet, I want to challenge you to follow after the example that the Philippian believers set and support the work of the Lord financially through your tithe, through your offering. If you don't know what tithe is, come talk to me after I explain it to you. So that we can continue to make an impact. You see, your offering, giving to help, uh, we talk about offering, but that's one way, but there are many others. But giving so that we can continue to make an impact for the kingdom of God right here in the East End, Right here in St. John's, right here in this region, the Avalon, right here in our province, beautiful province of Newfoundland that we, bl- we are blessed to live in, right here in the country of Canada and all around our world. You know what? Everything that takes place from city kids, and it's beautiful to, to go out there and see families connecting see people, you know, relationships being built. Everything from city, uh, uh, city tots to our kids' church, the kids are out now. From Lighthouse Youth that happens on a Friday to Conversation Cafe to our ministry to newcomers to our ministry to new moms to our online ministry to our Sunday ministry can only happen by your faithful giving. And so I want to encourage you to consider partnering financially. We're not going to take up an offering right now. Don't get nervous. 
But I want to encourage you to consider part, partnering financially and giving faithfully to see the work that God has started in our community continue and to see lives changed by the power of God. I can tell you, I've never, ever missed the tithe, what I give to God. Never missed it. Always comes out, never miss it. And I, I, I just love to, to know that that seed is being planted and he's doing something with it. To learn more about how to give, visit Bethesda.ca slash give. Text the word give, 709-701-3336. It's right there in your seat pocket or then that little card that Pastor Megan mentioned. Paul knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the good work that God started in the Philippian church, he would finish. And I believe the best is before us. Amen? Amen. The best is before us. It's going to take a partnership. It's going to take a partnership with the Holy Spirit, a partnership together. But I believe that God has something special in store. And Paul, in the Message Bible, puts it this way. And I love the way it expresses how Paul puts it. He says, there has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the day Jesus Christ appears. What God starts... He will finish. COVID don't, can't, can't stop it. The devil can't stop it. Nothing can thwart, the Bible says, the plan of God. And church, I know that the good work that God started in you and in I, he will finish. He will bring it to a flourishing finish. The good work that God does for us, salvation. The good work that God does in us, sanctification. And the good work that God does through us, service, will be fulfilled he will carry it on to completion. He will be faithful to all of his promises. God started it. I want that to be in your spirit today as you leave this place. God started it and God will finish it for our good and for his glory. Amen and amen. Father, thank you for this word. I pray it would fall on good ground. Let the seed of it, uh, let it uh, like a seed be planted that myself and everyone here and those listening online Father, that word will come to life and grow and develop into all that you desire to be in Jesus' name. God bless you.